uh, thank you all for, for being here um, and being here on time and live. So I know because everything's happening virtually now that um, some of you are probably going to be watching this in the future uh, at some time. Uh, so that's super cool. Um, I usually don't have my uh, presentations recorded. So it's finally nice to have one of these uh, recorded so I can see exactly what I said and exactly how I went wrong in this public presentation. So uh, my name is Manny Escamilla. I'm a longtime uh, historian for the city of Santa Ana. Uh, basically, you know, I've lived here um, a majority of my life. So ever since I was like one day old uh, and a couple of years away and a couple of years back and all that. So, um, you know, today, I'm going to start off uh, by basically working our way through um, a project that I've been working on for you know, several years now. So I started off uh, working for the city of Santa Ana in its public uh, history room. So there's a room at the Santa Ana Public Library that is kind of devoted to answering questions about Santa Ana history, uh, saving old records, you know, having photocopies of like, um, or making photocopies of uh, random historical items. Like it, it's a really cool room. Uh, so I served there for about 10 years uh, before um, working then over in the city manager's office for the city of Santa Ana and uh, three years in the planning department. So that's kind of what I uh, used to do. Uh, currently, I'm an arts commissioner with the city of Santa Ana and a uh, board member uh, both at uh, the Cal State uh, University of Fullerton is their kind of um, leadership circle over there uh, and um, for the Grand Central Arts Center and then with the Makara Center for the Arts uh, as well. So another like Santa Ana based uh, arts uh, and culture uh, center. So uh, today, we're going to be going through a field guide to Santa Ana's public art history. And I do want to uh, caveat kind of what we're going to be going over. It's not a total overview of a lot of uh, studio work, a lot of uh, kind of poets, uh, the written word. All of that is pretty beyond the scope of what I'm attempting to do here. Uh, so I am going to now uh, shift over to the actual presentation. Um, if I can share my screen and if it all goes well. Okay, so is that coming out for everybody? Let's see, Roberto, I'll just look for a thumbs up. All right, excellent. Um, so, yeah, you know, the first thing is that we ha we had a typo with the with the title. So it's Public Art in the Golden City: A Field Guide uh, to Santa Ana's Public Art History. So, there we go. Um, and yeah, you know, just kind of with the cover to start off. This is really the intent is to basically get a lot of the information that's being presented here and to put it in the form of a condensed uh, book, you know, just kind of a little bit of a field guide so that if you ever have a question about public art, it'd be like a little reference book. Uh, so this is some of the material that's going to come out uh, from that research and kind of how you know, got to this point. Uh, so I don't know if anyone's uh, from the northern kind of Mayberry Park area of the city of Santa Ana. This is a random sculpture that's in one of our parks, um, obviously not being used uh, as a piece of art uh, so much as um, for, for, for skating. So, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, when I saw this, I immediately thought like, oh, this is really cool. It's public art being used for something it wasn't intended to be, but it's even more artistic in some way because you have a combination of skating, you know, athleticism, and um, just a giant piece of steel that otherwise would be, uh, you know, not really used for much other than just kind of you know, being there in the middle of a park. Let's see. Next slide. Um, and this right here is probably one of the be best updates as to kind of where the, the status of this project is. Um, I'm going to click on the screen and hopefully it'll take me to the link I'm, it's supposed to take me to. So this is an interactive map or not, not, not very interactive, but a, a Google map of basically different um, pieces of art that have been documented throughout the city. So we have a uh, respeto. So this is a, uh, Mural by Sapo, uh, an organization that did murals here um, in the 2010s and 2000s. Um, we have some older uh, murals along Civic Center that we know that were there. That these you know need being need some work. Uh, I believe the items in green. These are all the ones from the different schools that we've been able to document. So, you know, there's a lot you know, in the city, right? So we're just seeing all these points. And, you know, that's just to say these are all different little aspects of Santa Ana, Santa Ana's kind of arts and culture history that can be viewed publicly. Uh, there's a lot less or probably a lot more out there uh, when we start looking at, you know, individual painters, artists, you know, things that are in private collections. That's, again, a little bit beyond the scope of what, you know, what I'm trying to do here. Um, but it is a good little starting point. You get to 
you get a feel for where there's a lot of you know, random public art, which obviously this whole uh, strip uh, between uh, 3rd and 4th Street in the alleyway, that kind of art alley. Um, you know, just geographically, you can kind of see how intense uh, that, um, you know, the, the number of murals and kind of, you know, pieces of public art are there, uh, along with this kind of little cluster over here, you know, further down the alley and then towards the artist village, which surprisingly, actually it doesn't have that much public art in it, it, like as compared to some of the other sections. So, you know, this is what's being added to, uh, but it took a lot of random work just to be able to get even to this point. And this is definitely not the end product. It's uh, just still the starting point uh, for, you know, what we're hoping, hoping to get done. So let's see, back to the presentation. Um, and, you know, some of the work just looks fairly boring. It ends up being something like this, right? It's a, it's a list of names and pieces of art. So, you know, up here on the, let's see if we can get this pointer going, up here, uh, Sergio Cadiz, you know, very famous uh, muralist, uh, worked with a lot of architectural firms, uh, did a lot of fine artwork, highly respected, you know, kind of has this whole legacy, you know, about him. You know, basically I'm going through and saying like, okay, he's got to work at City Hall. Uh, there's a slightly less known work that he has um, throughout the Civic Center that if you look at the design for other parts uh, of the Civic Center, like some decorative um, bases, you know, where you have a fountain, that's actually his work. And you can tell that it's his work because it's done in the exact same style, uh, done by the same architectural firm. It's got no, um, how do you say this, um, you know, kind of a signature line there, but you know that it was a piece of his work. So we're able to kind of say, all right, maybe that's basically item B. Oh, it's another plan in a different style. Okay, that's item C. You know, he worked over at Monroe Elementary, so, you know, so on and so on. Yeah, so basically just trying to get a, a super simple list like this. Um, you know, we only have 36, you know, artists and collaborations here. Uh, the current list that I have is up to about 120 right now. So each one of those is either one artist, uh, one particular site that has rotating art, or a collaboration between artists. So one of the things that you see, especially now, maybe more so than in other eras, uh, you'll have uh, something like over here with X the Weapon. So uh, friends, uh, Jovan Kingsby and Michael Zabrowski, when they work together, they work under a certain name, uh, but they both work individually, right? So they have public art that's both under their own name, uh, as well as in partnership or in collaboration with other artists. So it's like trying to figure out what those like relationships and patterns are. It's all part of this very boring list that I assure you is really important to the overall project. Um, and we would not, or I would not be here at this point without, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of help, right? So uh, Adriana Lelus, Lelus, I would never say her name properly, but hopefully she forgives me. Um, so she actually uh, came to me um, at the Santa Ana History Room back in 2014 uh, when she got a grant from, from OC Sparks. And that was basically to do this first iteration of what is in Santa Ana, like what public art do we know about? So um, at that point, I was still working at that Santa Ana history room and we kind of just went through it together, right? We we're like, okay, what is out there? Oh, sorry, um, out, you know, out of that project, we essentially identified 81 uh, different installations. So if you go over here to the Spark OC, it has uh, some of that information there. So this is definitely probably your first starting off point as far as how this list started uh, developing. Um, Adriana did the project and has continued to, to be an artist and uh, does their own uh, work right now. So it's still interesting, uh, very cool person, uh, you know, Santa Ana resident. Um, yeah, but this is kind of where it was left at, and it wasn't like the Spark OC had money to kind of maintain or kind of keep the, the database going, um, but since it was done as part of this grant, she allowed us to basically continue to use the initial map that we created, along with a list um, in an Excel document, or an Excel, um, what, what is it, a Google spreadsheet document. <laughs> so we just kind of kept that uh, up and, and running and just requested, you know, additions from time to time. Uh, I believe that that list now has maybe about 60 uh, entries in it. Uh, I would highly you know, encourage any artist that's out there uh, to reach out and we can kind of keep adding, you know, to it. So that's one of the, the fun things about this project is that it keeps growing. Uh, we had a partnership that developed with uh, Jamila, uh, Dr. Uh, Jamila Moore uh, over at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, so they did this whole thing with mapping arts OC. So if anyone's interested to see how some of this information and data was then, you know, continued into a um, digital humanities project, uh, I you know, recommend clicking on this little link down here. My understanding is that we will be able to share these uh, presentation slides later. So we'll, we'll find a way to, to get that to everybody. So don't worry. Uh, we'll make sure that this uh, presentation is made public. 
So, you know, great stuff there. Uh, that was a partnership in 2018. Uh, and then there is continued effort uh, by the city of St. Anna to then kind of say like, all right, well, we want to get a more robust catalog. Um, by this point, I think I was working in the planning department. Um, I'd helped out with the arts and culture master plan. And then we had a grad student that came in that was like, hey, let's really, all right, let's work on this. So we, uh, this is Charles uh, George Allen. I don't think he was able to finish everything, but you know, he definitely kind of helped uh, add a lot of those spaces, especially uh, the list that you saw with all the schools. You know, that was really important. So we got a lot of information from the school district um, and you know the arts and culture office. So Tramley and um, Gabby. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on Gabby's name right now, last name. But uh, Gabby over there is very uh, much you know, part of this effort. So she's been out there uh, kind of helping keep this alive. And, you know, at this point, you know, the information's there. So I decided to dig in and do more research on it kind of uh, on my own. And a lot of that research would not have been possible without this person here. Uh, so this is Shifra Goldman. She's probably by far one of the most um, influential intellectuals to have ever kind of come out of Santa Ana. So she was a professor of art history at Santa Ana College for many years, uh, was one of the leading uh, voices and kind of authors and uh, authorities on uh, Chicano art, Chicano art in the United States. So her work um, was inspirational to kind of a generation of um, academics, but she also was the reason why St. Anna College developed an, an initial mural program. Uh, her uh, kind of daily habit was to go out and document uh, public murals. So, you know, she has like this collection here. This is just what was fitting, fitting on the cart, but imagine I'd say about, you know, 10 more of these carts filled with just images, right? So these are all filled with individual slides that are about, you know, 35 millimeters. Uh, so these old little slide uh, projectors uh, that you would use. A lot of uh, paper in her research notes, uh, interviews with different people. Um, so all that stuff was part of her research. It's now over at the University of California at Santa Barbara. So if anyone wants to go to Santa Barbara and go into the middle of a library and an archive and the special collections, I highly recommend this for anyone who's interested in um, just you know, Chicano art, Chicano art, uh, just is really interested in Latin American, the Latin American kind of visual cultural experience. Like I learned a lot just by going through this collection. It was um, uh, Basically, if anyone out there wants to be a PhD and is looking for a subject and is kind of in this general area, I highly recommend like looking into her. Um, someone definitely deserving of a more intensive biography. I don't think there, there is one quite out yet, uh, but that's a whole nother discussion for a whole nother day. Um, but again, without these sorts of sources, it would be impossible to kind of recreate some of this lost public history that is out there, but requires a little bit of digging. So uh, an example here, so uh, just to kind of give some context, all of these, so each one of these little lines is a different image, right? So it's one image, another image, another image, um, organized uh, usually by author or by artists. In this case, John Valadez over in Santa Ana, which is my magic word. So I was going through these boxes, you know, no index, you just have to go through them and you have to see if there's anything that says Santa Ana, Orange County, anything like that. So it was literally just going through slide by slide. Um, and this is summer festivals in Orange County, 1997 uh, to 98, uh, 15 by 70 feet. So this is a 15 foot high mural that's 70 feet wide, oil on canvas over at the Ronald Reagan Federal Building. Uh, so we know it as a giant white uh, courthouse building. Uh, what a lot of people don't know, um, because unless you are going in for federal charges, you usually don't walk into a federal prison or a federal office, right? You're just like, or a federal uh, courthouse. You're like, eh, I'd rather not go there. It's a little bit intimidating. Um, but there's a really beautiful mural on the inside by John Valadez that captures the history uh, of Orange County through uh, these summer festivals that kind of represent the different cult cultures of the city or the city of, of the county. And here we actually, in her collection, she was friends with uh, John Valadez and actually kind of followed the work. So she was able to get uh, photographs uh, initially or of, of the actual kind of initial sketches, right? So we see uh, some of these lines that maybe some of the things have changed. It's a little bit difficult to tell. We'd have to go back to, to Santa Barbara to get a higher resolution scan. But you know, the basics of the, of the final image, they're all here. And you can see how the work was being done in studio. So the various undertones that were being used, they're like, oh, wow, this is, again, just amazing to see the, the entire project laid out kind of in a, in a giant warehouse. So this, you have to remember, is about 15 feet. Um, so hitting all the way pretty much to the roof uh, on a canvas that's here. 
and you get to see the way that the project develops over time. So you get this wonderful detail, nothing quite in the background yet, but you see some of the, the colors that start popping out and eventually you end up with something like this. So this is on the inside of the federal courthouse. So if no one, or if anyone, you know, once we kind of open up again, wants to go and is walking and getting some coffee at Cafe Calacas and they're taking, taking a while, um, you can actually just go right across the street, check out the mural really quickly, and then be back in time with your coffee. So it's, it's a really nice little stop. Um, yeah, and there are things like that that we can basically, you know, that are sources that are out there. So that was really cool. We have more information on the John Valadez piece, hoping to kind of compile it. So it would basically be like a little page talking about um, the mural, when it was created, all sorts of other things. Um, and in this case, you know, the, here's like an example of the way like, you know, different works would be sort of organized or at least kind of thought of. Um, this is a Sergio Cadiz piece at City Hall. Um, a lot of folks maybe have seen the one in front of the city hall, and maybe not this one as much. So let's kind of give some area. This is like San, the Santa Ana Library back here. Um, this is where there's offices on the second floor, but it was all stuccoed over. So in the 1990s, the city expanded its um, its office space, and essentially covered this up with pieces of metal and stucco. So it's literally, there's like a flat stucco face with a hollow interior that is covering up this kind of cultural gem that is part of our public art history. Um, and yeah, this was happening at the same time that we we're trying to be a city for the arts. So it's kind of this really weird thing where you have a really wonderful piece of public art, uh, but it's not necessarily appreciated because it's not in a style that's either popular or, you know, for whatever reason, the new architect decided that it was not a good idea to leave this element exposed. So that's a whole thing there. Um, you can still see his work over, I believe this is at the, this is the Monroe Elementary mural. So if you go down in front of Monroe, um, this is part of his work and uh, it's very angular. You see a, that in a lot of his um, bigger pieces. Uh, what was less known and people didn't quite realize is the old mural that was there on Chestnut uh, was part of Project Pride. Uh, and he was like the lead designer. So he didn't necessarily, um, I say this, he wasn't the only one that would paint, but he would basically have something that would be a layout and then have other people collaborate either with themes or, you know, just providing the basic sketches and then working with uh, other uh, community members to finish a piece, which is you know, very integral to the, the type of work that he did. So this is Sergio Cadiz um, over uh, in front of Fountain Valley. So this is just a good photo of him. Um, you know, this work that he has kind of back here has a whole kind of story behind it, but it's part of Fountain Valley and we're here to learn about Santa Ana today. Uh, but suffice it to say that, you know, it was such an important story that there, there's a book on the importance of LA murals and they use a, a piece from Sergio Cadiz from Fountain Valley to talk about it, right? You know, so LA basically takes all the good stuff and it says, you know, it doesn't really like credit when it's in Orange County or anything else. Um, so I like to say, you know, look at this from a Southern Californian perspective. So that way includes all the various counties and all the various locations. But um, yeah, this is just a really great uh, work of art that he's in front of uh, and a very interesting story to boot. So I, always, I, I recommend it. There's going to be a link uh, in one of the following slides uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we're, we're talking about there. Uh, so this is one of the other pieces uh, for Sergio. So let's go back um, right here. It's the Mecha mural at the Neely Library. And this was in um, Schieffer Goldman's collection. So these photos are all from those little slides uh, in those giant little kind of metal cabinets or, you know, where there's hundreds and hundreds and you know, I think, well, thousands and thousands of images. And this is actually, we get to see what it was like putting this together in 1974. So this is you know, a bunch of students out here at St. Anna College. Um, it's hard to tell at St. Anna College, but we can see it over here. Um, with this building, I'm forgetting. I had a lot of classes here, but I'm forgetting what the building is called. Um, you see just the themes and the way the way that it's still being painted and it's uh, being created. So again, San Ana College, the students mixing the paint. Um, this was essentially re-found. Uh, so this was in her collection as well. And is now being hung up. So you get the original design that they're working from. Uh, obviously, this is treated much more uh, carefully now. But in you know, this case, you just have a bunch of paint cans on it. And, you know, people pretty much stepping on the paper. Uh, but, you know, it goes from a blank wall, the basic outlines and proportions, different students. You know, I love this kid over here on the ladder. I don't, I don't know if he's really helping or if he's just like there hanging out, but he's there. Uh, definitely very 70s. 
Um, and you get to see him actually apply the brush strokes, right? So there's this like part, you know, this is essentially the rib cage. So we know that he was there applying paint as well. Uh, so these are the types of things um, I'm hoping that in this field guide, we're able to kind of highlight, uh, maybe look at a piece in particular and kind of dissect it more in depth. Uh, and, you know, it was, I was very lucky with these two pieces uh, or with this piece and the John Valadez piece you know, that there is some material out there. And it's a matter of like finding it and like seeing what else we can you know, try to try to do there. Um, and, you know, the question becomes, well, then like, what is the limit of this, right? Like so far, I think I've talked about some murals, um, you know, mostly Mogadis and uh, about Valadez. And I think that's kind of like the easy um, low hanging fruit, right? Where we say like, okay, these are things that are publicly visible that everyone's like, oh, if you have a field guide to public art, murals are definitely a good bet. Um, so this is uh, one in that the, the, over there on the, the, what do they call it now? The, the Cajon del Beso. Um, so this I believe is Moises Camacho. Um, this is Shmi uh, with the Heavy Collective uh, over by the, let's see. Oh my gosh. Hmm. I want to say North French Street, but then I'm, I'm probably going to get this wrong. Uh, but it's behind the McFadden uh, uh, public market down there. Uh, and another uh, image with Emilio Vasquez over at Santa Ana College inside of the, I'm not sure if it's still the Johnson Center or if it's uh, the, all I know is that it's next to the computer lab. So again, it's been a while since I've been at SAC, so I'm forgetting all the names of all the buildings. Um, I don't know how I can see the chat on the this. So I'm not seeing any chat so far. I mean, there's no questions on there so far. All right, cool. So in that case, I'll totally keep going with that pause. Um, so anyways, if anyone's at SAC and it knows like, okay, what the name of the building is where the computer lab is, you know, throw it in there for everybody. Because I am forgetting. Uh, and, and again, like when Santa Ana's kind of thought of at the, at the national level, our murals are often used kind of as a placeholder for like, hey, this is where, you know, what we're talking about. This is like who who we are and kind of placing it. So a uh, pretty famous mural with Carlos Balam and uh, going through the uh, kind of veterans, kind of the veterans that were out of Logan, out of Santa Ana, and basically you know, the Mexican-American uh, fighting, uh, uh, fighting men and women of the... World War One, Two, and Vietnam era. So I, th I think there's some Korean uh, war vets here as well. So yeah, you know, this is uh, you know kind of the front page of the New York Times. You know, talks about a change in California, Santa Ana being part of that, and you know, not uh, accidentally, the murals themselves are kind of part of that story that gets created. Uh, so here's a little video. Hopefully, um, this will show up for you. So I'm gonna play, play. Oh no. Let's see. Play. Well, I just didn't want to paint the same cliche they have with the Mexican American, you know, especially now in times that our community has been so attacked from all kinds of, from all different ways. You know, these men are leaving proof that of their Mexican heritage, and some of them were even, you know, they were born in Mexico, went to World War II, and. I wanted them to be, to be remembered this way, not just, not just for them to see. Oh, look, look at those Mexicans working in the field. Oh, look at these guys working in the factories. It's more than that, you know. It, it conveys the power of, uh, of unity. You know how, you know, the, the spies that this men grew up in a very segregated uh, society, they were still managed to, to go to war and be able to, to leave the racial barriers aside. Cool. All right. So this is me thanking the OC register for that. So you know, it's very rare that you'll get me thinking, thanking the Orange County register uh, for sort of things, uh, but I'm thanking them for that. Um, so again, murals definitely going to be included in the field guide. That's something I think it's like the number one thing that people think of when it's when it comes to public art. Uh, sculptures as well, whether they be temporary, uh, like this visiting sculpture uh, set that we had and were kind of placed throughout the downtown. Uh, things that are a little bit more permanent but somewhat forgotten. Um, you know, the 1936 era was kind of this time frame in which we created a lot of civic institutions in the city. So like the Ebel Building, um, the Bowers Museum, the old well, second old city hall. Uh, there's one before that. <laughs> um, 
and yeah, you know, we have actual sculptures and kind of pieces of art, uh, both uh, indigenous pieces of art, and then also kind of this uh, very traditional um, kind of 1930s uh, uh, sculpture set that's actually part of a memorial fountain over there. So, you know, a lot of people just kind of walk by it, but there is a lot of detailing that is still there uh, within the courtyard of the Bowers. So I highly recommend before you go into the Bowers to take a look at all the uh, sculpture work that's actually kind of ringing around uh, the various little alcoves that they have there. So it's a, it's a cool little experience. And so that's one of the other things we'd like to, or I'd like to include in this particular uh, project, uh, being able to kind of point these things out that, you know, anything you might walk by uh, that uh, is, I think, uh, of interest and has a little bit more of a backstory. Um, and to get, give one backstory, uh, what are the people that, or what are the persons that, um, worked on some items in the Bowers. We, we don't really know exactly which aspects of the Bowers that she worked on, uh, but we know that she worked on this. This is Ada Mae Sharpless. Uh, she was uh, someone who graduated from Santa Ana High School, again, in the 1920s, uh, went on to do works uh, with the WPA, uh, the most famous of which is the Lady of the Lake over at Echo Park. Um, so sometimes there are going to be probably tangents talking about people that were from Santa Ana that then had kind of really important or really interesting work that was outside of the city. So that's something I'm playing with. If everyone here is saying, boo, don't do that, only Santa Ana, that's also, I guess, something uh, that's an option. But I, I really do think that that's uh, an important uh, story um, and you know, part of uh, Santa Ana's kind of public art uh, history. So I'd like to you know, include aspects like that. Uh, so again, if you're ever down by Echo uh, Park, or at Echo Park, at Lady of the Lake, Ada Mae Sharpless from Santa Ana. Um, something that is a little bit more temporary and hard to, hard to kind of to pin down though, sometimes are the performances, right? So sometimes they're really interesting uh, physical performances, uh, you know, you'd say artistic performances. Um, and it's not just limited to their music, uh, you know, kind of spoken word or and that sort of thing, but things that involve a particular time, place and have I guess the best way to say it is kind of an artistic interpretation to what they're they're attempting to convey. Um, so over here is probably something that's unquestionably considered performance art. And in fact, is kind of like one of the bases for performance art, like in talked about in art classes and uh, art schools across the globe, uh, is a performance piece by Chris Burden called Shoot. Uh, what people don't know as much is that that particular performance was done uh, in Santa Ana at a small uh, studio in the industrial part of town called F Space Gallery that was on South Grand. So there's this random industrial building that's like a tire shop now. and one of the most important performance pieces of all time, like at least of the 20th, this 20th century kind of performance uh, art movement was done there. And it's not something that uh, we kind of like say, oh yeah, that's part of our artistic legacy. We have that happen here. Um, and we're gonna do a little video clip on that one. Uh, this other one by Albert Lopez, who now works with the Orange County Museum of Art, uh, was done in front of uh, Delhi uh, Community Church uh, down in the Delhi neighborhood. So, you know, he's actually you know, working on this as part of his performance, again, with UCI, um, as part of his artistic practice, um, having a piece where he's basically, you know, using his physical body to pull a van and seeing whether or not people participate and helping, assisting, just viewing. Uh, so that particular performance piece also comes along with having an entire um, mobile gallery within the van that's being pulled so it's got like layers of meaning and interpretation you'd have to talk to him about what all those layers are i am a local historian i am not uh the the best art theorist out there so that's a whole nother area uh so again these performances i think are interesting um because they're so temporary it, it is something that you have to you know document or have to try to uh, explain because it's not something that you would know just walking into a parking lot about the, you know the history of a particular spot or location you know as it relates to art performance uh, so that's something i think that would be a really cool little value add here um and in this next slide we're going to learn a little bit more about that performance with shoot because uh, again i think it's a really fascinating story of performance art in the city uh, that will be included in that field guide. We had a line taped on the floor and I stepped up to the line. He said, okay, ready, let's go. And I said, yep, let's, let's go. Then I aimed and at the last instant, I, I guess I pulled a tiny bit to the left.
he turned white pretty quickly. He, his lips kind of got blue almost, and he, his face went white. I, I wasn't expecting that. Okay, so again, that was a little bit odd, right? I guess, you know, talking about public art and it's a person in a warehouse uh, being shot for a performance as part of a UCI, um, yes, as part of his UCI master's program. A little bit weird, um, but, you know, very foundational to kind of extreme performance art and like is, you know, part of like Chris Burden's like career trajectory. So he was a, uh, uh, really, I think what people know him now for is more uh, the la the lamps actually outside of LACMA. So all those lights, uh, the city lights that are out there, that's him except in his youth doing stuff that was more performance-based uh, than you know, his later work uh, that we probably recognize a little bit more. Um, so shifting kind of from like that high art to something that's a little bit, I think, more, more uh, commonplace, you know, something essentially categorizing as casita or tiendita art. And part of that just ends up being that I think folks would unquestionably say that, you know, knowing this mural um, in front of El Toro and literally saying like, okay, el que no conoce El Toro no conoce Santana, like that is part of kind of the visual legacy of the city and knowing a little bit more about the, how the logo was created, um, the story behind El Toro, the fact that uh, the person that owns it, I think was trying to create like a, a, a rancho, like almost, uh, how, like Knott's Berry Farm out in the middle of the Central Valley. Like there's like some really interesting history and story there. Um, and that is, I think something is part of a proper art field guide you'd want to dive into and that there, there are interesting aspects to that. Uh, there's also, you know, the visual kind of religious iconography that's all been really present throughout Santa Ana. And especially in this particular uh, location that is essentially, you know, the entire house uh, here on South Broadway becomes a giant altar and I, I it's temporary in nature it has a very kind of religious uh, sacred uh, aspect to it uh, but it really is like you know transforming an entire an entire home into a religious work of art and it happens on a fleeting basis but it is something that I think a, a lot of us that have grown up in the city and especially if you ever pass by it on accident for the first time you're just like wow what is this this is amazing you know this is like I want to know more uh, so there are little aspects like that, you know, this would get its own entry, you know, diving into a little bit more detail um, into that story. So, you know, those are the types of things we'd like to, to dive into. And, you know, just like the little random murals that are, are throughout obviously have religious iconography. Uh, and then they occur in the most random places. So this is just going through the um, the Pacific Electric uh, bikeway, and you're walking, you're walking, and then you just see a cute little uh, religious uh, mural, and it's just in front of a garage, this old sliding uh, barn door style garage, and again, you have these little things that pop up throughout the city. Sometimes you don't know what to do with them. I was walking around, I see this giant chicken, the entire house is this type of lime green, this type of lime blue. Again, this rooster is huge. If you put it in the middle of a gallery, it would sell for, you know, $40,000, but it's in front of like somebody's home. It is definitely all, you know, put together. Um, in fact, you can even see the paint still being applied here. It's being put together with thought and reason and by a particular person to kind of express themselves. And this to me absolutely is artistic expression. It's just, it's a little quirky. And then I don't know like how much to explain it. And then like talking to the person, getting the story, um, you know, turned out that the, the, the guys you know, stopped by and the guys said, oh yeah, my mom just really likes these colors. And then she just started like doing this and she just kept going. So you walk in you know fairly regular suburban track and then you just get a giant rooster staring at you and it's, uh, you know, el pollo de oro. Just, so it's, it's really cool. And you'll have these little like uh, casitas that the, themselves um, have a high degree of folk art uh, incorporated into their presence. So the other big example, I think, is um, uh, the Chivas house, right? So the entire thing is decked out like in support for the Chivas. And then there's the Casa America, right? And those, <laughs> it tells you about the culture 
Um, it's art, an artistic expression and I, I think would deserve, be deserving of any sort of kind of like public art, uh, public field I, public art field guide recognition. So that's the other thing I'm trying to track down because there are a lot of neighborhoods out there. Like I still like walk into a different neighborhood that I, you know, I grew up in a particular part of town, didn't go to the other part of town. And then I'm like, oh, wow, there's a giant like Aztec mural on the side of this home. This is really interesting. Let's dive into that. Uh, so there are little things like that uh, that I'm hoping through this process, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to send out this work and this book and get it out there. And everyone's going to be like, well, you missed this, you missed that, and you missed that. And like, I'm going to be really happy when that starts happening because then you're like, you're right, I missed it. Let's start adding it in there. Uh, let's see how much of a comprehensive list we can get going. So that is definitely going to be a plus. Um, and yeah, there's going to be random tiendas as well that just have art that I can't identify, that I have no idea. You know, there's no artist here. Can I have to go in and talk to the, the, uh, the owner? Uh, this is over at uh, El Indio um, and on Pacific. So cool stuff. And it's important not to pass by these places without like thinking about it. So a lot of these old tiendas, because um, sometimes you go to a place like this, El Tapatio on South uh, Standard, you're like, oh, number one, they have really cool lettering. So I really like the signage. You know, these old signs are, are pretty cool. But you walk in and there's an Emilio Vasquez that's perfectly preserved inside the entire, um, at this point, it converts into a salon. So, you know, this is like someone who's recognized as being one of the greatest, like, kind of Chicano artists of his generation. Just a little signature here. And this is just where people, like, on South Standard go to go, go get tacos and just, like, hang out with their family. And if you want, you have a baile, you can go rent it out. You know, this is a sort of... Um, history that's also kind of in this quasi public space uh, that we can also highlight because we know that we have Emilio Vasquez murals on public property and then there might be some work to preserve that. But if this, you know, taco place had not stuck around for all these years, and it would have converted to something else, you know, it was it's still a possibility, you know, they can basically be lost. So these are things where recognizing its history, uh, the importance of it and letting more people know, I, I think it helps save these things in the long run, quite honestly, because again, you get really great details. It's really cool, you know, if he was around you know, and I had a taco shop, I'd, I'd love to, to have him paint some stuff. Uh, <laughs> so what, what I think in public art, maybe in this field guide aspect starts getting a little bit more controversial is like how you approach street art. Um, so in certain locations, it kind of makes sense, right? It's a blue lot private yard that allows different people to basically, you know, say like oh, graffiti on it, but it's not graffiti, it's, you know, street art, it's individual artists um, kind of working and having a place where they can create uh, their, their pieces. Um, this is over by GCS. The problem here for me is that each one of these sides, like literally this is one piece and then it transitions to another piece like every other month. This is another one. This transitions to another piece every other month. This side over here transitions to another piece every other month. So like the, the speed at which um, graffiti art is produced, created, and then basically recycled and removed is incredible and it's very hard to document. So um, I'm literally trying to learn how to scrape websites and scrape social media accounts just so I can find out what GCS has posted over the last five years to be able to get an understanding uh, of all of their, uh, their art over there. Um, other places are a little bit more like, well, this is, this is graffiti, but it has a certain aesthetic to it that I think is also important to either re to recognize, highlight, or at least talk about and include. So this is uh, the sunken lot that has been proposed to be a, a townhouse development now, I think, for the last eight or nine years. Uh, but they're on 4th Street, again, next to the West End Theater. You know, barbed wire isn't keeping anybody out of this thing. So that always transitions and always changes. Um, there are certain aspects where you'll get a random, um, you know, piece of public furniture, in this case, the, the trash receptacle that gets painted. Um, Free Humanity is from Santa Ana, and he's known uh, globally, and in fact, probably one of the more famous local artists. Uh, so this particular uh, dumpster was painted over again, but if he had kept it, and again, put it into like a gallery somewhere, again, would have been like worth $40,000, $50,000. And so you could have just like walked off with this like piece of art um, that just gets painted over instead. So that's something I think it's, it's pretty funny, right? So now the, the way that I would explain it to people is like, well, if you could go back in time and not paint over a Banksy and instead just kind of like take it and then like put it somewhere, you know, that's kind of like what we tend to do to a lot of our local artists, right? We just kind of cover them up if it's not authorized, makes sense. Uh, but in a situation with a dumpster, you know, I, I, I tend to see less harm kind of coming from that. 
Uh, there are also other kind of hidden away locations. So this is next to one of the rail spurs uh, on the south side of the city. Uh, this entire kind of walkway, it's roughly, it's almost like a mile long. You can just go through and there's like pretty much uh, graffiti on either side. Um, you know, don't recommend there going there alone at night or anything like that. Uh, but it is an interesting spot. And it, it is definitely something worth considering when it comes to kind of if you want a field guide, you want to go into those places that are a little bit harder to get into as well. Uh, and one of the most hard ones to get into uh, is actually this area here. So it's part of the Santiago Creek. Um, I haven't been there in a while, but I remember um, maybe about four or five years ago walking through and just kind of seeing graffiti art again all throughout this underpass area. But there's this little like break here. So you get this very kind of cathedral-like um, aspect where you have this like single source of light coming in from about hundred feet above you. And it just comes down and if there's water in the riverbed, like it lights up the water and it reflects and then you have like all kinds of art around you. So it's almost like this cathedral to, to uh, graffiti uh, in the underpass. There's a lot of needles there. I don't recommend going there without boots. It's not like clean or like dreamy by any stretch of the imagination, but it does have a certain like, wow, this is, if you pass through here, you will definitely get a taste for street art and graffiti in St. Anna at the particular time that you're walking through. So it's something to, to be aware of, but not necessarily everyone's cup of tea. Um, and, you know, that I think goes to the idea of like, what is accepted, what is not. Uh, Carlos Balam, who we just heard from, um, you know, would paint his uh, garage door. And, you know, there were neighbors that actually called in uh, code enforcement against him because they didn't like the type of art that he was producing because they said it was graffiti. Um, he was not cited for graffiti. But, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, people kind of calling things in saying, you know, one person's art, one person's graffiti. It, and that was, you know, a little bit of a, of a dicey situation. Um, in this case, you can paint your house without a problem, so there were no citations found for that. Um, there are other issues at play. You know, however, you still get someone who felt as though they were being censored and someone who um, had a fairly uh, large following when it comes to, you know, kind of the production of local art. Ah, okay, the one time I think I'm going to be reading from this. So, I'm looking at the time and I want to make sure that we don't go over. So uh, this is basically just a, a poem that was created uh, by some artists uh, that were living on Third Street as it was being torn down. So it's talking about uh, the day that they tore down the street and the artists left their lofts. Um, let's see, as slowly as old turtles towards a warm sea of memory. Uh, <laughs> so this, you know, seems like, okay, it's maybe talking about art artists being displaced now, but uh, this was back in the 1970s uh, when there were a lot of other buildings there on 3rd Street and it was replaced with a parking lot. So you have this kind of center for art, so a lot of um, early graduates from UCI, um, kind of this nascent uh, hippie countercultural movement of people that started using a lot of the buildings that were in the downtown when there wasn't that much demand for spaces in the downtown. 430 car parking garage there on Broadway. You're like, oh, we're going to create an artist's village, so we're going to decorate this parking structure with art because we just displaced all these artists from the 70s that we didn't want, but now we want more artists in the 90s because they're going to be the good kind of artists, not the bad kind of artist. Um, and we're eventually going to have uh, this little thing here. So this little piece right here, um, I'm going to tell you now because you can't do it anymore. Um, if you were just to steal one panel, steal this panel, and this is like a Vladimir Kora who's like really like one of the... Um, Mexico's most famous contemporary artist. So if you wanted to just steal this little piece, um, you could hang that up in a gallery pretty much anywhere in the world. You'd be totally fine with that. So now you can't, um, you know, this is the detail. It's very, very simple. You know, the, he kind of just got invited over. He was there in the downtown, he got invited over and he just did his whole thing um, because now it's just blank and it's gone. So, you know, this life cycle of how art is there and it's so temporary in, in a lot of ways, um, I think goes to the importance of why you would want to have uh, documentation of this and why it's also difficult to do that documentation in the first place. Um, so here, this was over at um, the Excelsior um, newspaper offices there on Grand Street. Uh, I, one thing I never noticed until today is Noticias, uh, the mural is that terminado. So it literally is some, it's a paper announcing the completion of its own mural, very meta, I like it. 
Um, there's a little bit more of a, a backstory here that I believe the Savariano wrote um, when that became this. So you have this kind of colorful wall um, in this newspaper office. It basically is totally whitewashed. And then the only thing you're left with is a security camera. So it's the demise of print media, the beijing of everything, and the um, rise of the surveillance state all rolled into one particular action. So if you want to look at a blank wall and try to think deeply about it, you can. If you want to also just keep walking by, also an option, but probably not for the people that are going to be buying this. Um, if they want to, want to think a little bit more deeply about how their spaces are created. And you know, there's some stuff where we just don't have anything left, uh, which it's really kind of sad. So the only thing we're going to be able to do is try to document it because there's nothing left of it. Uh, so this is a man uh, by the name of Manuel Hernandez Trujillo. Uh, you can see his name over here. Um, was working with the Black Panthers and um, other kind of radical uh, uh, social progressives uh, in the Bay Area. He's from uh, initially from from Santana in Garden Grove. Went uh, to go study in Mexico City. Um, and brought in a lot of indigenous motifs. So he kind of introduced uh, indigenous motifs to the Bay Area printmaking scene as one of the folks that started doing that. Um, but a lot of his public works were, were kind of destroyed, right? So he um, was printmaker, so he didn't really sign a lot of stuff, but then some of the public work that he did um, was destroyed and we have some photos of it. So this is over there on Civic Center Drive, uh, working with some students. Uh, he ended up teaching at Valley uh, for many years. So he was a Valley um, a teacher uh, as a math teacher. So he went from arts to math and helped uh, start some of their initial uh, folklorical folk classes over there. Uh, and is one of the reason uh, Malakis Montoyas of Oakland, you know, pretty famous um, Chicano artist came down to Santa Ana and had his own presentation. So we have little bits and pieces that we can kind of start stitching together. Um, and again, th these kind of notes and these field notes are going to be attached to pretty much like blank spaces or spaces that are missing, or even you know, the, in, in some instances, we know that there was a wall. We don't know where it is, uh, but we know that this is a story behind that wall. So these are all little things that still need to be pieced together. Uh, this was one that was still his poten potentially his. Um, so it was at Fremont Elementary, kind of had this algebras thing going on. Uh, this was recently whitewashed and then just kind of replaced with the word Fremont uh, on it because I don't think anyone knew that it might have been associated with him that did did that. So even kind of a self-awareness for uh, the school district is also sometimes not there when you kind of have these older paintings and you don't real realize what that history is. Um, so this one famously was uh, destroyed. So this is a mural on, um, let's see, on Reed Street. <sighs> totally sad. It was definitely, you know, falling apart in a lot of different ways, um, but was, you know, part of the neighborhood. And we, luckily with this one, there are a lot of photographs that have surfaced of the original um, quality, kind of when it was barely done. Um, so if you decide to go through the hundred other slides that are part of <laughs> this presentation, a lot of them are just random photos, uh, including about five or six uh, from this when it, when it was premiered. Um, so someone that I, I love to, to have connected with and that has been kind of helping out with some of this, uh, like as far as finding out more information is um, Ma Marina Aguilera, Aguilera. So she is a local artist, um, was involved with some of these early Chicano uh, works. So this is over by uh, Fifth Street uh, near Jackson. Uh, again, uh, something that was kind of destroyed, covered up. We don't really have anymore, but this is part of an old uh, union hall that was there. Um, we get kind of these grainy shots from an angle. We're hoping to go through and connect with the folks that submitted this that so we might be able to find better photographs or just do higher resolution scans. Again, murals that were part of this kind of Chicano movement in the 70s that then ended up being destroyed, forgotten, or otherwise erased, um, but trying to bring back the memory of them as, as well. Um, so this is a, the probably Marina's uh, biggest piece. So this is over at El Salvador Park. So we're, we're lucky that we at least have this kind of like grainy image of it. So we're hoping that in some trunk out there somewhere, people have higher quality versions of this. Uh, and that's you know, still something we're going to be digging for, um, hopefully finding um, you know, you know, things as the research continues. Um, let's see, yeah, with, with uh, only eight minutes to go. This is a pretty grainy photo. I apologize for the, for the quality. Uh, this is a slightly better quality version of, <laughs> of the wall there on Civic Center. Uh, 
Uh, there's currently a restoration effort that's being put together. So if anyone wants to kind of help preserve local murals, um, the folks over at Artesia Pilar are trying to put together some money to replace um, and restore this particular wall. It's a uh, Civic Center in Holly, I believe are the intersections. And you know, these were done in the 1990s by students, again, from Valley High School, inspired by the murals that they saw from the 1970s by Manuel Trujillo. Uh, and these are still around. So there's a chance potentially to do that second generation uh, to save some of that second generation Chicano art uh, with a lot of the first ones already kind of lost. So, you know, this is a little Santana, a little better. Uh, this needs to be fixed up a little bit, but still, still salvageable. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I just want to include this one. So this is Emilio Vasquez, uh, actually included in another modern mural down on 4th Street. So I think there's a growing appreciation for this heritage of public art and having kind of even some of the newer artists recognize um, some of that tradition that they've also participated in growing up or at least seeing visually like in, in their surrounding community. So this is pretty cool. Um, and again, we can go back to, to this. Um, I have this in here in case anyone in the comments, which no one has been commenting, uh, or anyone was curious as to whether or not particular items were included. I don't know that we have that much more time. Um, so that will probably be left for another day. Um, and the rest are all bonus slides. So this is bonus item number one, um, unless someone has a question. Oh, OK. So we have something from Omar Avilos um, with Francisco Salcedo from 2011 to 2012. So four murals over at Willard Intermediate. All right, cool. We can include that. I see one of our other um, arts and culture, in fact, our arts and culture um, chair on here. I don't know if you wanted to add anything. I see, see you unmuted yourself. Yes, I did. I seen you. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, we're here. Uh, do you have a question or something you wanted to add? Well, as, as you're ending your session, as you know, we have a challenge in aspect of how we're going to structure the policy and how we're going to be doing the future for murals in Santa Ana. And uh, I mean, a recommendation on how we approach that for a city that, you know, of course, is 80, 90 percent Latino and looking at what's going on and the gentrification and, and the, you know, new material coming in and working with Marina, it's kind of like, how do we accomplish that, that, you know, that we're all happy with and we still keep our culture without upsetting anybody, but we are going to have to come down and put some policy on how we look at the future. I don't know what your perspective is on that. Okay, well, uh, well, since we are not at a meeting and we don't have more than, like, I need to check right now to see if we have more than three or more than four commissioners on here because it's a possibility that there are other commissioners on here yeah um yeah, let's see let me let me double check that before i brown act myself and that's just like let's see one two three okay there's only three of us i think is um let's see who else is here yeah robin is here and I think that's okay. We're good. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So that was all just to say that. Um, so um, he and I are both on the Arts Commission. Robin McNair is also on the Arts Commission, who's in the audience. And you cannot have a majority of any public commission talk about a particular subject together it, um, without it being publicly noticed. So that would be a violation of California state law if we were to do so. But now that there's only three of us, we can openly discuss, no problem. Um, yeah, so I, th I think it's still that balance between the reason I think Santa Ana has, has such a rich legacy in the first place is because we are very, there are no rules when it comes to private property. Like you can do whatever you want um, as long as it's not an advertisement for your own business on your own wall. And that has led to a lot of the creation of these murals, right? So it's not so much that the city is has been led by a lot of funding from the public sector so much as that a lot of private interests are allowed to create stuff on their walls and i've always stressed the notion that the city should have at least a one cent or a one page statement saying that private walls ha are unregulated by the pub yeah private art walls are unregulated by the city period that the city will not does not give does not uh seek any permits does not require 
um, um, any sort of application fee, does not need anything in order to create murals. I think that's one aspect of it. Um, we should also, though, at, at the same time, say if you'd like to register your mural to have like um, to fully implement uh, the, I think it's the California. I'm not sure it's the Visual Rights Act, but it's basically, you know, you as an artist would like to protect your work and to make sure that you're the registered artist for a particular work so that you can protect it and there's at least some sort of documentation for that with the city, that we should start a registration process for that. Um, and that we should also balance out how much can the city afford to create new walls with a, an equal proportion to preservation. So I think that doing those two, uh, there's more money to be made if we if we actually train a group of people here um, in Santa Ana to do mural restoration, they could then do mural re restoration work in other cities, right? So that's part of like also the, the economic benefit of it is to put in more money into preservation training uh, for our local artists. Uh, and then, you know, you know, balance that with the creation of new murals. And I think it's gotta be roughly 50-50. So that's that's that, um, man. And I think we have about two minutes left. So someone, our two folks did answer that it was the Cesar Chavez building. Building A is where the Emilio Vasquez mural is uh, in the inside of Santa Ana College. Um, you appreciate everyone being here. I, I think we have maybe a, enough time for one question, either through the chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, because otherwise, I'm going to go through and literally click like a slide a second almost because I, we can do that, let's see. Add the link to the map. Ah, yes, uh, so I'm gonna throw that, because I don't know if we're putting it anywhere else. I'm gonna throw that onto the Zoom chat. So if you're listening to this somewhere else, uh, feel free to reach out um, um, either on Instagram at Full Metal Archivist uh, or just Gmail is manual J Escamilla at Gmail. Um, so just type in my name, track me down somehow, um, and you can you, you, we'll, we'll send send the link. I'm hoping we can actually share the uh, PowerPoint as well because yeah, there there's a lot more slides. And in fact, let's see, that's 62. Okay, we're gonna just go super fast. So this is Philip K. Dick, very famous novelist in front of the um, Catholic Church over at St. Joseph. So if you want to like connect with one of our local famous writers, you can put your hand in the same spot that he was at. There you go. Um, potentially to be included are actual um, galleries and places where art was created. This is a little bit more of a stretch goal because there's a lot <laughs> to collect there. So this is the Cage Chameleon on Main Street. Uh, this is the really kind of famous work or a close up with a famous work uh, with um, Sergio Cadiz that was very, very long over in Fountain Valley. Uh, and, you know, it's always kind of recognized for its story. Um, this is the inside of the, the wall there at the federal courthouse. So recommend walking there again. If you're at Galacas and they're taking a while, go across the street, admire the mural. You're good. Uh, Dino Perez on the inside of a tienda over there at the Libro Mobile. Good stuff there. Santana, a little hood. Cool. And I think with that, we're reaching our time. And now you can just look at the pretty photos as this all ends. So you don't have to look at my face. You look at the photos. Um, now, Gilbert, Elizabeth, is there anything else we need to do to close out? Or is that, that's pretty much it. 